So, uh, in his uh, opening remarks for this summer school, uh, Kiran uh, showed the uh, histogram that he, I've seen him show in many meetings. Uh, the uh, number of papers that cite density functional theory that are published per year as a function of the year. And the, the number of papers is growing uh, exponentially and uh, exceeding 30,000 per year now. Well, I have a uh, I have a colleague who works in the uh, <coughs> field of uh, model Hamiltonians for strongly correlated systems, and uh, he told me that he has also seen the, those histograms, and, that, uh, and because uh, I should explain that that this this field of uh, model Hamiltonians doesn't have nearly as many citations as DFT has, my colleague told me that he thought that figure was in very poor taste. <laughs> but of course I don't. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the, the, the history and sociology of density functional theory. I'm going to be your guide for the uh, in, in three tutorial lectures for a whole zoo of approximations, density functional approximations we can make for the exchange correlation energy in order of increasing sophistication. And um, the first one is a local density approximation from Conan Sham, 1965. Uh, for short, this is called the LDA. And it comes from Cohn and Sham. The same paper where they derived the exact Cohn Sham equations that Kiran told you about. They also proposed this local density approximation for the exchange correlation. <coughs> now, uh, before, uh, before Cohn and Sham in the 1950s, there was work by John Slater. Slater had what he called the X-alpha uh, approximation, which was a kind of local exchange approximation. Uh, he didn't, Slater didn't have a theorem, and he had one parameter in his functional, uh, one of the parameters adjust. But uh, aside from that, he had the Cohn-Sham equations, uh, which he thought of as an approximation from the beginning, uh, because he was starting from hartree fock theory. Slater actually developed the hartree fock theory in the early days in the 1930s. He was one of the people who developed it. And so he was thinking about approximating hartree fock with, with a functional dimension. Uh, and he had a method to do that, and, and calculations were done for molecules and solids in the 1950s. And there was a, a group of Slater disciples who continued those calculations into the 1960s and later. Uh, but generally speaking, physicists didn't pick up on this method. Uh, and in fact, uh, chemists didn't pick up much on it either. So, so in, the, in, uh, in 1965, chemists were mostly focused on solving the hartree fock equations exactly, and physicists, uh, solid state physicists were solving the Hartree approximation. The Hartree approximation is one where we just set EXC to zero. That's the simplest approximation and the crudest approximation. And it's actually very crude. It gives very bad results. You know, the, it, it gives you binding in, in many cases, but it's very weak binding, very weak bonds, very long bond lengths, very long lattice constants, very low phonon frequencies. Everything was kind of wrong, quantitatively wrong in the, in the Hartree approximation. But physicists were using it into the 1960s, and even up to about 1971, uh, this Hartree approximation was for some reason the method of choice. So I was a graduate student at Cornell from 1965 to 1971. That was six years after the uh, Cohn-Sham paper. No one ever mentioned the Cohn-Sham paper to me. 
Uh, in my dissertation, I used the Hartree approximation like all, all the other physicists in that time. Uh, we could have used the Slater approximation even before 1965. It would have been much better, but no one wanted to use it. And after this paper, Cohen-Sham paper came out, almost no one wanted to use that approximation for six years. <clears throat> and then in the early 1970s, uh, solid state physicists started to test the, the, the local density approximation from Cohen and Champ. And they finally got much better results for the lattice constants of solids, for the phonon frequencies of solids, for the surface energies of solids. Everything was much better with, with LDA for exchanging correlation. And, uh, uh, and then people started to pick up on it, and it, it became very popular in the 1970s in physics and in the 1980s and 90s in chemistry. <clears throat> so uh, so that there's a message here, I think, for, for all of us. If you do good work and nobody cites you for six years, <laughs> don't give up because you can still win the Nobel Prize. Right? <laughs> sometimes it takes the world uh, some time to catch up. <coughs> okay, so what is, uh, what is this? Uh, so Kieran wrote down the uh, energy functional. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so we're going to write the ground state energy functional for electrons of density N and an external potential B or R. It's a sum of terms. Uh, uh, exact, but in, in a sense it's exact by definition. We simply define the Hartree energy as the sum of the first three terms. This would be the Hartree approximation without self-interaction correction. And then EXC is everything that's left over. It's, uh, it's the correction at the end. But of course, the important thing is we know that there's a theorem that tells us that there is an exact functional of the density for, for this correction. And uh, as I said, if you, if you leave out, you know, the Hartree approximation is, is just EXC equals zero. That's not a very good approximation. It binds, uh, it binds electrons into an atom in a fairly reasonable way, but it does not bind one atom to another in a, in a, uh, in a very accurate way. Typically, one atom will bind to another to make a molecule or a solid, but in the Hartree approximation, the bonds are much too weak, radically too weak. The bond lengths are radically too long, and so on. So even though EXC may be a small part of the energy, it's a critical part of the energy if you want to study bonding. And typically, we want to study bonding. We're, we're interested in what happens when you put atoms together to make molecules and salts. If we get the right answer for that, you get a good approximation for EXC. And, and the approximation has to be good in two senses. It has to be First of all, it has to be reasonably accurate so that we can get realistic predictions of our calculations. It also has to be uh, calculationally feasible. And remember, in, in 1965, it would have been difficult even for physicists. Very few physicists could even do, uh, I guess no physicists could do solids with Hartree Clark in, in 1965. Uh, now we can do that, but then there were, there were no codes. Uh, so uh, the Hartree approximation was computationally easy. And the nice thing about the LDA is that it, it wasn't computationally more complicated than the Hartree approximation, but it was much more accurate. Now what is this EXC? Well, it's basically it's the correction to the Hartree approximation. 
And what are what are the sources of the correction? Well, the first the first correction uh, is is uh, pretty easy to understand. Uh, this Archery electrostatic energy is here. I call it the classical electrostatic energy. It's based on the idea that the electron density is simply a rigid, continuous distribution of charge. But we know that's not true. The electron density comes from a swarm of electrons. The electrons are fluctuating. The, the actual density fluctuates in time, and the density that we use is only an expectation value of the density operator. And so, so there are many effects that are, many, many effects are left out when we leave out EXC. And the first one is that uh, it, it accounts for the provides a self-interaction correction. To the Hartree approximation. Because if you leave out EXC and apply this, this, this Hartree equation to a one electron problem, you get the wrong answer. Karen pointed that out. So EXC has to provide a correction that makes the functional exact for any one, any one electron density. And it also uh, describes how the uh, how one electron avoids another as the electrons move through the density. It's another. And there are essentially two reasons for why electrons uh, rarely bump into each other as they move through the density. The first one is the uh, Pauli exclusion principle which says that two electrons of the same spin can't come together at the same point in space. That's one version of the exclusion principle, at least. And uh, the other is the, uh, this is responsible for the exchange energy. This comes from the Pauli principle. It's there, even, it's there for non-interacting electrons because they also have to be fermions and obey the Pauli exclusion principle. The other one is the Coulomb repulsion between electrons. Uh, every electron pushes every other electron away through a Coulomb repulsion force. And that's what creates the correlation energy, essentially. Okay. <clears throat> and it's these effects that are it's these effects that are responsible for most of the bonding in molecules and solids. It's easy to understand why that is if you think about it qualitatively. Uh, when two atoms are far apart, uh, the electrons in this atom can only avoid other electrons in this atom, and the electrons in that atom can only avoid electrons in that atom. When you bring them together. Uh, the electrons in this atom can avoid the electrons in the other atom. So there are more possibilities for electrons to avoid each other when you make a, a combined system than when you make a separated system. And so the energy is lowered more by these, these uh, avoidance effects when you bring the atoms together. And that's the main reason why atoms bond to form molecules and salts from the many body point of view. Of course, you can describe it in one, one electron language in a very different way. But from a many-body point of view, that's why bonding occurs. Okay, so what is this approximation? Uh, EXC, LDA, uh, Cohn and Sham, uh, Look, we're looking for something that would be better than the Hartree approximation. So let's make a local approximation like the Thomas Fermi approximation, but not for the kinetic energy, just for this exchange correlation energy. So they wrote an integral, a single integral of a three-dimensional space, the electron density at a point R in space, and then a function, epsilon xc uniform of n of R. 
And this epsilon xc of n, uniform of n, is just a function of the number n. And it's the exchange correlation energy per electron in a gas <coughs> of electrons with uniform density n. That's an interacting gas. It's not an ideal gas. It's an interacting gas. Why this form? Well, uh, they designed it so they designed the local approximation so that it would be exact for uniform densities. Exact for any uniform density. Because uh, D3R is the volume element in three-dimensional space, N of R is the electron density. If I take the product of those two, I get the number of electrons in the volume element D3R, the average number, because of course the number is actually fluctuating as electrons move into and out of that volume element. But the average number is N of R D3R. And then I assume that the exchange correlation energy for electrons in that volume element is the same as it would be in a uniform gas, epsilon xc of n. And of course, if I, if I have a uniform density, then this, this becomes exactly the exchange correlation energy of that uniform density. Uh, so, LDA is exact for uniform densities and it's also accurate for slowly varying densities. Let's see. I have an eraser somewhere. Oh. Let's see. This is So LDA is accurate for any slowly varying density, any density N of R very slowly over space. What that means is that uh, the gradient of the density divided by the density is some kind of inverse length. And that inverse length has to be small compared to the typical inverse lengths in the uh, interacting system. One of those inverse lengths is the Fermi uh, wavelength. Or, uh, and so the inverse of that is the Fermi wave vector Kf, which is which in the uniform gas is just 3 pi squared times the density one third power. So I can define a Kf as a function of position uh, if I use the, the density here as a function of position. And then at that position, if, if delta over n is small compared to Kf, then, then that helps to define a slowly varying density. But there's another condition that should also be satisfied. Because there's another length, there's a screening length, and the inverse of the screening length is the Thomas Fermi screening wave vector, which in atomic units is not the density to the one third, but the density to the one sixth power times a constant. So, pi squared and half six power. <coughs> These are the two characteristic lengths uh, in an interacting electron gas. One is the uh, one comes from the kinetic energy, and it's a typical wavelength of, of uh, electrons on the Fermi level. The other comes from the screening effect of the, uh, that one charge has on another. That basically comes from the interaction, and that's uh, that's given by this Thomas screen. Uh, now, Cohen and Sham. Uh, 
needed uh, to, to, to make a, a practical calculation, that they needed to know what this function is, what epsilon x uniform is. And what was available to them in 1965 was the Wigner approximation. And that's what they used in, in, the, earl, in, the, in the earliest uh, Cohen-Sham calculations. And for instance, in the, the calculations that Lang and Cohen did for the gelium surface in, in the early 1970s, they used the, the Wigner approximation from the 1930s. Well, we can write this exactly as the sum of an exchange board and a correlation board. And we can even write down what, exactly what the exchange part is for the uniform gas, because Dirac worked, worked that out in, in the 1930s, I believe, as well. And uh, that's easy to do, because in a uniform uh, electron gas, the Cohn-Sham orbitals are plane waves. So you just have to evaluate the exact exchange integral of plane waves, occupied plane waves. And when you do, you get the following result. So this is some negative constant uh, times K, Kf or different a different negative constant divided by Rs where Rs is a typical distance between electrons yeah, strictly Rs is the radius of the sphere that on the average contains one electron in an electron gas density. This is, this is exact and it comes from Dirac. And then there's a correlation part that came from Wigner. as an approximation, so I use an approximation sign here. Uh, minus AC divided by BC plus RS. And this is from Bigger in the 1930s, who made a very shrewd uh, sim but simple estimate of the correlation energy of the uniform gas. Isn't it uh, epsilon x, uh, epsilon c? Should be epsilon c, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that our million student card? So the young cohort, like one over six. Oh, it's, uh, well, I'm using atomic units. So this is actually not dimensionally correct if I use MKS units. But I'm using atomic units where h bar equals m equals e squared equals 1. So the Bohr radius, h bar squared or e squared, is, uh, is 1. So, so lengths, lengths are dimensional. Otherwise, we'd have to put in some factors of h0. Okay. So this uh, this Wigner formula has a few features that you might notice. Uh, it has simple limits. For instance, it's a simple formula and has simple limits. For instance, there's a high density limit. where uh, Rs is going to zero because the radius of the sphere that contains one electron on the average is going to zero. And uh, then uh, this EC uniform goes to, when let Rs go to zero, I just get minus AC over BC and just a negative constant. 
So the correlation energy per electron in the Wigner's approximation goes to a negative constant in the high density limit. Yeah, that's not exactly right, but it's but, but the difference is, is fairly small. Yeah, the right answer is log of Rs, which is a very slowly function, very function of Rs, almost a constant. And the low density limit, where Rs goes to infinity, correlation energy starts to behave like exchange. In the sense that it goes like one over Rs the same way that exchange does. That's actually correct. I mean, that's the right answer. The low density limit correlation scales like exchange with the density. <coughs> now, nobody uses the Wigner formula anymore, but it's simple and easy to think about. Uh, we now have much better uh, much better formulas for EC uniform that come, for instance, from quantum Monte Carlo calculations plus exact limits, exact high and low density limits. That gives us uh, an accurate EC uniform. That's all well known. There are a lot of uh, different analytic parameterizations for this function. They're all essentially equivalent uh, if they're approximate, if, if they're representing the actual interacting electron. <clears throat> you do a sharp screening here, but do, do we know it for, for any density? Or is it? I didn't hear a word. I uh, use what? The, the RS. RS, yes. Uh -huh. Where do we get it from? Oh, oh it's, uh, RS is related to the density. So, <clears throat> so uh, the density, the average density, is 1 over the volume of the sphere of radius RS. So if you know the density, you know RS. It's another way of carrying the same information. <clears throat> you can say that RS is the radius of the sphere that on average has one electron in it. So one over the volume of that sphere is the density. Uh, okay, so, so we now have more accurate uh, input for LDA, but we also have the more accurate functionals than LDA. The LDA was the simplest uh, starting point from, uh, that Cohn Champ could make. Once I asked Walter Cohn about uh, what, what he expected from the local density approximation, when he published it in 1965, and he said, well, we expected it to be better than the Hartree approximation. But the expectations were pretty low because they didn't really think it would be that much better than the Hartree approximation, and it was. It was when people started to test it, and um, <clears throat> and actually better than better than the Slater X alpha too. So so now we have much better functionals, uh, but the LDA is still important for three reasons. Uh, so. I'm going to say GGAs, meta GGAs, hybrids, RPA, like approximations, all better than LDA. In the sense that they're more accurate. Of course, they also start to get a little more expensive as you go up this ladder, and when you get to RPA, they're a lot more expensive than LDA. But the accuracy certainly improves with, with better functionals. And, and, and these lower runs, GGA and meta GGA, it's only a modest increase in cost, a factor of three or six or something like that for LDA. So why do we care about LDA anymore? Well, there are three reasons. LDA is still important. I, 
think it's safe to say nobody uses LDA chemistry anymore. Almost nobody. <clears throat> Sol many solid state physicists still use it because it's not bad for solids at all. Although we can do better. But, uh, but the main reasons why LDA is so important is that, first of all, most of these functionals go back to LDA in the limit of a uniform density. They recover LDA in the limit of a uniform density. That limit is important. Getting it right is important uh, for reasons of maybe I'll mention later. Um, secondly, uh, for historical reasons, the effort to understand why LDA works so well led to these higher level functionals. It wasn't obvious that a uh, it's not obvious that a functional that's only exact for the uniform electron gas is going to be good for real atoms, molecules, and salts. But it is. And uh, you can make other functionals that recover that limit that are even better. <coughs> So, the, so there's something there that needed to be understood, and I'll, I'll be talking about that. So, uh, so how do we construct these better approximations? Well, uh, there, are, there are different strategies, but uh, I would say that, that a main strategy has been to look at the exact functional of its properties, to look at the, the exact properties of the exact functional, which we can now do because we have, uh, we have two different definitions of the exact functional. One is the adiabatic connection formula that I'll mention later, and the other is the constraint search formula. From those, uh, from, from the adiabatic connection formula, we can derive constraints on the exchange correlation hole, which I'll mention later. And from the, uh, from the constraint search that Mel talked about, we can define exact mathematical properties of the functional Vx, C, and N. And we can make a, a we can design our uh, approximate functionals to, to share the exact properties of the exact function by, uh, by imposing the, those properties as constraints, exact constraints on its construction. And so the, so the underlying exact theory has two rules. Uh, it uh, shapes the approximations to it. First of all, it provides an existence theorem. That's very important because to make these approximations, you have to work hard. To work hard you, uh, on something, you have to believe that, that there's something to be found at the end of your search. And the existence theorem tells us that there is an exact functional of the density for, for the exchange correlation energy. Uh, and so this motivates us to look for it. But then in addition, uh, we have the um, exact properties. of EXC of N can be built into the approximations. That's 
possible in straight satisfaction. Okay, how am I doing on time? We have about five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Okay, so so let me say something about the the early history of this constraint satisfaction approach. Uh, okay. So 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 the so an early exact expression for EXC is this adiabatic connection fluctuation dissipation theorem. And it says that EXC of N is equal to <coughs> something that looks a little bit like an electrostatic interaction. between the electron density at R through the Coulomb interaction 1 over R prime minus R with another density which is actually a function of R and R prime and is defined called the exchange correlation hole density. So <clears throat> NXC R and R prime is defined to be the density at position of R prime in space of the, not of the electrons themselves, but of the exchange correlation hole around an electron at position R. Uh, so it's a function of two variables. Mm -hmm. I will find that after that. Okay, good. Okay, then I won't, I won't try to define it. I'm just going to talk about it. I'll just talk about the problem. But, okay, so so uh, this comes from uh, David Langreth and me and from from uh, Ulla Gunnarsson and Mike Lundquist. So Langreth at Purdue, 1975, Gunnarsson and Lundquist, 1976. Although the language that I got to it slightly earlier, probably slightly earlier, I think it, the explanation is actually a little better in this paper. Um, and and uh, this uh, exchange correlation hole density is the sum of an exchange hole and a correlation hole. Exchange hole is from the Pauli principle, acting even on non-interacting electrons, the correlation hole <coughs> comes from the Coulomb report. Uh, and from this expression, uh, which Kieran is going to show after lunch in more detail, uh, you can derive the following exact properties of hole. is that as an electron moves through the density, it's surrounded by a hole, a, a region of space where the other, that the other electrons avoid because of the Pauli principle and the Coulomb repulsion. And this hole follows the electron through the density and of course forms as, it, as, as the electron changes position. Uh, the first exact property is that the exchange hole density is always non-positive. It's negative or zero usually negative. The integral of the exchange hole density over R prime for a fixed R is minus one. <coughs> and the integral of the correlation hole density is 
zero. And so what these equations say uh, in a quantitative way <coughs> is that around one electron, one electron is missing. You know, if, you, if you count the other electrons around a given electron, you don't get n, you get n minus 1. So around a given electron, one electron is missing. And that's why the whole density integrates to minus 1. That represents the missing electron. Uh, the uh, correlation simply rearranges that miss, the, the density of that missing electron, but doesn't change what it integrates to. So the correlation of all density integrates to zero. Now, now, what does this have to do with the accuracy of the local density approximation? It has a lot to do with it because in the LDA, we, when we approximate the energy by uh, using uniform gas input, we uh, are also approximating the exchange correlation hole uh, to be the whole of a, a uniform electron. So NX CDA, R and R prime, the density in R prime of the XC hole, change correlation hole of a uniform electron gas. Of density n at the uniform density, but uh, we, we choose it to be the density at the point R. <clears throat> and because this is the whole of, of a, a possible physical system, now the uniform electron gas, of course, is not a real physical system. You can't go to the laboratory and make it. But it's a possible physical system in the sense that we can write down a Hamiltonian for it and it satisfies all the conditions of the Hamiltonians that we talked about this morning. And, and therefore, if, if, if we use the hole from this uh, uniform electron gas, we're going to automatically satisfy all three of these exact conditions. And when we satisfy those three exact conditions, we put strong limits on the, in the value of this integral. Because when we integrate, <clears throat> uh, do the double integral over R and R prime, uh, the value of the integral is, is constrained because the value of this function we're approximating is also appropriately constrained. And that's, that's the real reason why the LDA gives realistic energies, even for atoms and molecules and solids, where the density is very far from uniform. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Do you have time for questions? Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask regarding the implementation that we do in uh, DMT calculations. Uh, I will go a bit off topic, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. When we add the LDA plus U, for example, uh, in the equation and we do our calculations, we see that, of course, the lattice constant increases because we are adding the U. I would like to know how the exchange and the correlation is changing in this case because if, if we are moving the atoms away but also the others are coming more near to each other so mm -hmm. so the exchange and the correlation should change in, in that sense and how do we capture it? Well, okay, that's, that's a good question. I'm not sure that, that I can give you a very clear answer to it. <clears throat> so LDA plus U is not something I'm going to talk about in my three lectures. It's uh, <clears throat> It's, it's a, a method whose, I, I think we can look, some people look at it this way, and I, this is the way I would like to look at it as well. It's a way of making an approximate self-interaction correction to a function like LDA or GGA or meta-GGA, which is not self-interaction free. And, and so, uh, but it's, it does it in a funny way. So it, so it, doesn't, it doesn't introduce another term in, in, a, in a density function. Or rather, it, it, it introduces uh, an interaction between orbitals, and it does so in a way that's not universal. So you can't you can't do uh, LBA plus U or GGA plus U for an arbitrary external potential. You can do it for when the external potential is is a Coulomb attraction to the nucleus. Um, 
So, so, so I guess I would say that, that, that the best understanding I have of that is that, is that we are mimicking the effect of the self-interaction correction in a computationally efficient way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was another question. Yes. It's just about the integration over uh, the space here. A wrong, a given electron, but an electron is missing, I just can't understand it. Okay, okay. When you have zero for whole correlation, is there wrong for an electron? It's missing a whole. Okay, so you know, let me say a little more about that. So, so the idea is, so, so when we evaluate the electron density n of r, we go to a certain point in space r, and then we average the electron density over time or over the wave function to, to come up with a single number for the average density. Now when we, when we construct the whole density, we're going to take a different point of view. Instead of sitting at one point in space, we're going to sit on an electron and move with that electron through the density and look at the density of the other electrons with respect to that one. This is a quantity you can actually define from a wave function. I think Kieran will define it for you. Uh, from uh, from the interacting wave function. Uh, so so our, our, if we're sitting on that electron and moving through the density, the other electrons that we see around us don't include that electron. That's why the whole density integrates to minus one. The correlation whole density is not zero, but it integrates to zero because it has positive and negative regions. Correlation whole density is negative close to the electron because electrons are pushed away, but they're pushed further out, so they get positive correlation whole density further out. Does that make sense? Okay. More questions? I just have a comment on the question about how we need to use one of the top groups in the world. It's here at EPFL or Zari. And they have a methodology for extracting the U from the NFT calculations so they don't have to choose U. Yeah. And it tells you what it is as a function of separation and breaking chemical bond and it changes. So they have a something which is sort of closer to a first principle of the spirit. Okay. And then I regard that as one of the best ways to think about U. Yeah, and I do too. It, 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 you don't want to really take any parameters from experiment and fit to a particular system, right? That's <laughs> that's uh, that's counter counter to the spirit of DFT. But if you can find U from a calculation, then I think the I think the DFT plus U calculation means something. It, it, although it's not a real density function, it means something. <clears throat> Those, uh, those two degrees, is that where I'll find the uh, derivation of the XC hole for LDH? Okay, I missed the first part of your question. Say, say it again. I want to see the XC hole for LDH arrive in, oh. in those two papers. Or it's in somewhere else. Uh, it's in those two papers, yes. Yeah, in particular, I, I think you, if you look at the Gunnarsson and Lundquist paper, that's that's, that gives the clearest presentation. So you, you'll see an actual expression for, for the LDA exchange hole, for instance, which is easy to do. The exchange hole has a simple analytic form, and you can, you can extract it for, for the uniform electron gas and then apply that to any, any interacting system. Correlation hole requires some work. The work was done in this paper, but I think it's easier to think about the exchange hole. There is time for more questions or comments. There's a question. So what led uh, Kamishan to consider um, LDA as an approximation? I mean, of all the different approximations you can attack, you can attack the problem of why did they hold it that way first? Uh, I think they picked it because it was the simplest thing that they could think of and because they knew they knew about Thomas Fermi. So the Thomas Fermi method is a local density approximation for the kinetic energy. And although it's not a very accurate approximation, it's good enough for some purposes. So, for instance, you can understand how the total energy of an atom depends on the number of electrons and the, and the, the number of protons from Thomas Fermi. You get a qualitative understanding of how it depends on those things. Uh, 
So I think the, they went with what they knew. You know, that the, they knew that they knew they, they knew that LDA approximations give something useful. They didn't expect it to to get a highly accurate re result from LDA, but but in fact, when it was tested later, it did give accurate results. There's a um, comment. Sure. So they were, they were working on simple metals at the time, and that was called metallurgy. It was actually part of metallurgy. Uh, but they were almost entirely focused on simple metals. And that's why yeah. it seemed like a good idea. They thought the density, the pseudo density of a simple metal should be slowly burned. And that's yeah. why they thought for those systems, it would. Yeah, and, and for those systems, it's better. So, so the LDA is better for 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 uh, bulk metals than for anything else. They didn't expect. Yeah. So I think historically, uh, Cohn met Hohenberg in Paris, uh, and 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 they were both talking to Friedel, and Friedel was was interested in density oscillations around an impurity in a metal. So, I think it, it was an it was a, uh, the ideas were in the air. There's a question here. Yes, you earlier mentioned that by QMC calculations one can get an accurate um, correlation of the unit from electron dust. Mm -hmm. uh, would you comment on what kind of QMC this is, or is there a yeah. paper which... Yes, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of papers. I think the, the, uh, the, the, the classic paper is by separately and all that from 1980. Okay, so. so David Sepoli, Henry Holder, it's a physical review letter, I think. And so they did, uh, they actually did something that's uh, that's fancier than what QMC people do now. They, they did a release node QMC, and it seemed to work for the uniform gas, although later on it's largely been abandoned. I think most people who do QMC now do fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo. They actually did a release node diffusion Monte Carlo. And the numbers they got seem to be very accurate. It's not an easy calculation because the uniform gas is an infinite system. So what they have to do is start with a finite system with uh, appropriate boundary conditions and then extrapolate to the infinite size limit. Challenging. The last question. So. Uh, would this QMC calculation actually uh, preserves the, the uh, properties of the exchange hole being less than zero and, uh, and that the money would integrate over at, uh, exchange hole become minus one? Uh, yes, I, uh, within, no, within statistical noise, you know, it, it preserves all those properties. <clears throat> so they can actually extract that information from the QMC calculation. They can extract the exchange hole, the correlation hole and look at them. Okay, thanks John again. Thank